Welcome, everyone, to part three with guest Joanne Richards, who will be sharing more amazing stories that occurred with humans and extraterrestrials at the Interstellar Treaty Convention in Persepolis, Iran, in 1971. You will hear about one of my favorite fantastic cat species that flies that they first met uh, at a convention in Vesta, and I'll wait until Joanne tells you all about that. Joanne is a journalist and executive director of Earth Defense Force Headquarters. Her husband, Captain Mark Richards, U.S. Navy, and his father, Ellis Lloyd Richards, Jr., Air Force Major, were soldiers in a top-level military space command that performed intelligent operations since World War II. Many special operations included on-world and off-world contact with multiple humanoid and non-humanoid species that are and have ever been present throughout our solar system, galaxy, and universe. Oversaw security of hundreds of human dignitaries and 200 ET species at this Persepolis Treaty Convention. To give you an idea of what Mark's father, with young Mark's help, of course, had to organize, orchestrate, and protect, here's a brief description in Mark's own words. Quote, the best security organizations in the world came to protect the location and the on-world and off-world guests who would be there IS had over 100 agents embedded in the imperial household and another 100 agents among the private bodyguards of guests, plus another 40 were mingling with the troops of the Iranian security men. The Persepolis Iran location was picked because it was isolated and thus could be tightly guarded to protect many of the Earth's leaders and important other off-world dignitaries, end quote. So hopefully most of you have listened to part one and two and thus have been introduced to some of our galactic off-world and on-world ET species. Those on my email list have already received the shout out that has pictures of these species, many of which Joanne's husband, Mark, drew himself, and I'm very appreciative of receiving those. Please feel free to go to my Super Soul Solutions YouTube channel where I have worked long and hard to include many drawings, pictures, and actual photos for you all to see as you rewatch parts one to three. So with that, welcome back, Joanne. Thank you. Happy to be here. Oh, I'm so glad. So we didn't get a chance in the end of part two to discuss the outcome, the important outcomes for us humans that resulted from the uh, Persepolis or what we shortcut by the word conference, ET meeting. So would you like to share those outcomes with our audience? Sure. I'll share what I know because as we've said before, I don't have the the full report because he, Mark, never has had time to subtly finish it. But anyway, um, it was made really clear to us that we need to reach a certain level of like conscious development in order to be part of the galactic community. Uh, As I've mentioned in the other two parts, uh, most off-world species do not see humans as, well, they didn't, at least in those earlier years, see us as sentient beings because their civilizations were so much older and more advanced than we are. Um, it's it's important to know that every species has something to offer. So they were still they were willing to give us a chance and see if we could continue to develop. Um, the majority of those attending didn't want to give up on us, and we were ordered to go. One of the major outcomes that I always remember is that we were ordered not to go back into space. So I think our last moon mission was 1972. And I think uh, the the astronaut I remember who wrote a book about this and I met him was Gene Cernan. That was 1972. And I believe it was the reptoids who told us not to go back. But, you know, it could have been a number of species who just jointly agreed to tell us not to go back. And then, of course, the ban for no open communication between civilians and um, non-human species was still in place. So that, you know, started in 1961, was in place for 50 years, and then it's renewed. So that's that's definitely still in place. So those those are the major things that I, I take away from the conference at this point. Well, those are those are all major, and especially it makes sense. <laughs> 
uh, for anyone who's been following about, oh, why didn't we go to the moon, you know, or why haven't we gone back in a while? <laughs> and uh, as some of the super soldiers uh, on my show have talked about, well, there's antids on the moon and dracos were on the moon and insectoids were on the moon. And <laughs> so yeah, I, there, guess we there been... I guess we weren't invited oh, sorry, back then. <laughs> yeah, really. Go ahead. And, you know, by 1971, we we knew that there were numerous non-human species that had bases on the dark side of the moon that we just never see. And they didn't want us going there. Um, they weren't real happy. I think we went to the moon in the first place, but so a large, a large part of the major discussion on one of the committee meetings that was really important was that, you know, they wanted to know what our intentions were. So, um, you know, they didn't really, they, and they didn't. They don't want it. And I know this was going to be one of our later questions. I'm sorry, but they wanted to know what our intentions were, and they wanted to us to treat the moon well because it's full of resources. So there was a big concern among the alien species about you know what would happen if we continued to go out into space and and go to the moon. So, mm -hmm. you know. Too, too much and, competition and we, humans and all have, kinds of yeah, things. And yeah. humans have so much drama, and they really didn't want us taking all our drama out into space. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Not that they don't we have, have drama. Have you know, they have their own too. drama. But <laughs> <laughs> Can you believe the attitude of let's, pl you know, uh, plant our American flag, ha, 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 you know, like we're going to own the moon, you know? It's not right. the best it's approach. <laughs> I'm sure if we went to the dark side, we'd see lots of flags flying. Oh, yeah, yeah. Many, many uh, bases there. Yes, well, thank there you are. for that because that's, that's sure. important for the humans to understand because they, um, they're very confused about how this could be kept secret for so long, you know. And uh, <laughs> part of that will be understanding, late, you know, going through some of the radio shows and understanding how advanced – the scientific technology is for all those species and how they can cloak themselves, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It also yeah. speaks to, um, you know, there are many species who do want like disclosure and stuff and who do want to work with us. So it's not that everybody doesn't want to work with us. There's many that want to start interacting with us. So, you know, we just have to be good neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> that is a really important point. Thank you for saying that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, let's, we started to introduce the species called uh, the giant war beetles, which blew me away yeah, when love you them. said the queen. <laughs> yeah. So clicker. And I know you have a lot of information on that. So people can go back to part two to listen. And what would you like to share? Because I'm sure there's, uh, at least one fascinating story about Clicker the war beetle. Right, and um, well, again, the the war beetles they they have a caste system, and they're an insect species. But you know, the smallest one is like the size of a probably um, a Volkswagen Beetle car, and the queen could be the size no of like intended. a five ton truck. <laughs> Pardon me. No pun intended. There, she, the Volkswagen no, no. Beetle. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I used to have a VW Beetle. And so oh. they, they vary in size and they don't really fly, but they've got, they do have wings and stuff. They don't really fly. They One one of the casts is a, a war beetle, so they're there. And it's not like they're violent and going around um, starting wars and everything, but they can defend themselves and they can defend against enemies if needed be. And one of my favorite stories was, you know, we talked about the, the cat species with Contessa Leona. She looks, they look like panthers and they walk upright. And so Clicker was working, you know, before the conference started, Clicker was working with um, Contessa Leona at one of her digs. Her, or the, the war beetles can be very dangerous, but they cannot be corrupted. They can dig like high speed bulldozers and they can, you know, they're thinking and they're smart. And they're they're very Zen like. So they have a they do have a spiritual um belief system, so that that's cool. But one, one of my favorite stories is at the site there were twelve uh quadruped robots that started to attack 
attack them all, and Clicker's team was able to destroy them quickly in less than a minute or you know about about sixty seconds because they can belch like heated plasma from their throats. Think of a think of a dragon, you know, spewing fire out of its throat. They can belch um, heated plasma out of their throats, and the enemies. You know, done in sixty seconds. So that that was just the other story I wanted to share with you. <laughs> I oh get my goodness! Out of that. Yeah. Do we know who sent the uh, robots? Which group? I don't. I don't know who sent the robots. Yeah, but they definitely didn't want. Okay, so what what Contessa was looking for was proof that we were indigenous. So whoever. Uh... Um, there were nine species coming to the conference who all said that they created humans and they so they wanted to be the god of this planet and rule the planet and Contessa Leona's job before the conference was to go around and find evidence that basically we were indigenous that basically none of those species created us various species perhaps enhanced us so that we'd be able to thrive on this planet but she did find evidence that no one of them created us now, I promised everyone that we would talk about the four-foot giant bee buzzers and how they okay. saved the attendees' lives during the convention. And it's such an amazing story. So if you want to share that, I would love that. And and what is delightful <laughs> is I, I did have a little chat with um, Titania, who was there. And, and you know, she was, uh, well, she would have been in her early 20s by then. And um, and she had a, a her her oldest child was uh, like a baby at the time. Anyway, but it was her task and her, one of her sisters, at least one of her sisters, and they were entertaining and hosting several of the raptor families that you know the perhaps the male raptors were you know attending as delegates to the conference. So she had uh, charge of well, supposedly charge, you know, it was her job to entertain them and, and, and move them around to different locations if that was needed. But they were at one place called Sudley Castle, and um, and there was this attack on them. And what was interesting, I asked her, and, and the thing to know is she is deceased, and I talked to her through a channeling medium, so it's all very exciting for me. But, um, you know, to get somebody else's perspective that was there besides just listening to my husband talk about it. Even though he has her diaries, so that's pretty cool. Anyway, um, but she said she felt really helpless because imagine these centipede creatures coming to attack. But what was interesting is, you know, and it's funny because, like I said, her job was to you know, take care of the raptors, especially the little raptor children. And, and they thought it was really funny that humans would be able to take care of them. And, you know, <laughs> not that they... <laughs> <laughs> Not that they really, I mean, they they come out of their eggs learning how to defend themselves pretty much, and you know their bodyguards were always in the background. But and the raptors are so smart and they can take care of themselves very well. But this was basically to give the moms a break so they could go shopping or at least you know get away from their kids from for a little while because you know moms, no matter what species they are, just need a break. So what's what's interesting is the young raptors they can smell their enemy long before it ever gets there, and these centipede creatures had sent out some scouts, and the young male raptors you know saw this the scout and you know was kind of following it, and they've got like a hundred legs, not the raptors, but the <laughs> the centipede, and They're 30 feet and it long. knew. Yeah, they're huge. They're huge. And like yeah. horse size, a horse size and like a thousand pounds. And the centipede gets up to the building and, and the raptors, the, the children, uh, or the male raptors that were following it, uh, they were, you know, so excited to play heroes. And they jumped through the windows into the, the castle where maybe people were having dinner or just enjoying the evening or whatever. And they, you know, set off the alarm that these creatures were coming to attack them. And the centipedes w would have been brought there by themselves. Um, they couldn't, I don't think they could do, you know, travel through wormholes. And I don't know if they have, so I don't know, I don't know where they came from. And I don't know who brought them there, but somebody else brought them there. 
and the male, like I said, the males were very sensitive to them, and they felt a vortex open up, and then they, you know, found out this scout was coming, and they could smell the enemies, and it was huge. But now the interesting thing is, and we're going to find out about the the big cool buzzer bee things, um, the the centipedes, which were called assassinapedes, were ancient enemies of the buzzers. So I didn't know that, and um, the, all the let's see, the centipedes were a big delicacy to the buzzers, so they didn't mind helping us. And at one point, <laughs> the raptors had helped the the buzzers. Uh, at some point. And these buzzers so that, are giant bees, four foot tall. Giant the buzzers bees, are a giant, know. like a giant honeybee. <clears throat> so these centipedes are these amazing killing machines. They have poison and they can like grab you and poison you. They're, uh, they have a natural force field. And this with these fangs, they have fangs and I'm not describing them as well as Titania did, but they've got fangs. They hate everything. They're used to their you know natural planet is heavier than earth, so it was it was really interesting um anyway, so a bunch of them were were gonna be coming, and their plan was to attack and and kill everybody. They're also covered with a hard armor armor and so what was what was interesting is the buzzers happened to be at another nearby castle because they were setting up some kind of uh oh Lightning. satellite or something <laughs> yeah they Some were set, of... yeah thank you they were setting up a satellite mm-hmm. system or something and we can get to that in another page but they they must have sensed the call or and they knew about some rogue spaceships that had landed so you know they were on the alert anyway they get to Sudley Castle and they were able to um, like grab hold of the centipedes and disrupt their energetic field somehow and basically just because they had this like electric force field and they could, it took two of them to kill them, but they would somehow like disrupt their energy field and then kill them. Amazing. So that's kind of it in a nutshell without reading the long pages. (laughs) Right. Right. Mark said they all um, burned very in pain immediately. And the whole thing was over super quick. So um, yeah. evidently these giant buzzers have a history of being able to manipulate. You said it was like lightning going through the air, kind of. I was just going to I would have thought, you know, okay, two insects, you know, you got finger or your fangs, you know, and you just go at it. But it was the whole, it was the whole energy field type thing that was, so like the lightning does play into that. It was, it was more, you know, the energetics that they were disrupting that amazed mm-hmm. me. And um yeah. One thing that Titania was saying, and it's probably in, again, because Mark was using Titania's diaries when he wrote his report, but um, she was saying it was so cute because the raptors, the the young raptor males formed this defensive, like, circle around the women and the children. It was really interesting to get her perspective on that whole whole thing. Um, That that is, and evidently that was the first time, like Mark said, they had heard about that the buzzers existed, but no one ever knew about them. And they just showed right. up in tons of ships and tons right. of display, like of power, right? And uh, right. then I guess we were able to work out a treaty afterwards, too, with them. And and the other thing, you know, she, as a witch, had tried to use her magic and her ability for mind control and spells on these centipede things. And I think she even had a gun with her, but none of that was going to work on them. And so then, like you've already said, probably, the buzzers, um, they look like a honeybee. They're over four feet tall or about four feet tall. They've got two strong back legs, um, two toes on each foot, and two fingers on each hand or paw. And they're covered with a soft black fur with yellow stripes to show oh, that show their family and their bloodline. So, so that's pretty cool. Like something out of Disneyland. <laughs> I know. Well, yes, and that that was it. It does look like a Disney character. So mm-hmm. yeah, it was it was pretty funny. But that was that was kind of a horrendous, you know. Ter- it was just terrifying. Um, yeah. But thankfully, you know, the buzzers the buzzers were superior to the assassinapedes, 
and um, and he and the prince prince of the buzzers prince red black and there's a string of numbers um, you know mm-hmm. he and Titania hit it off instantly so so that was pretty cool he was very fascinated with this female and you know her magic and her scent and all that cool stuff so yeah that was mm-hmm. you know and what I love about these reports is that they're so full of extra stuff you know I would just think of <laughs> okay just just tell me what happened. Just tell me what happened at the conference, you know. But mm-hmm. yet, like I said before, there, it's like you, the report starts probably like two weeks before the conference on everything that was going on before it and who's all involved and and all that stuff. So amazing. Exactly, <laughs> it is. And so uh, we we probably wouldn't be there uh, here if it no. wasn't for the giant buzzers because Titania, who's from a royal witch line and was. Um, I would say a partner of Mark at the time. And uh, so she was trained in all kinds of abilities and she had a dagger and all her abilities, just like you said, didn't work. Right. Right. In less than a, less than a minute. And uh, this, this thing is writing in pain and dead. And so, yeah. Uh, yeah. And what is, what's a correlation a little bit is uh super soldier captain, Randy Kramer said uh, that he, was actually really scared when he would meet the assassin of peace that some of the groups, which I won't mention, used them as bioengineered pets. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, protectors. Yeah. Watchdog. And he uh, had to go to a meeting once and that watchdog was sleeping outside and he just said, Oh my gosh. Oh my evidently gosh. They, evidently they can rear way up and then they just come down on you with an open mouth. You know, it's almost like those, that Dune movie where the sandworms you know, oh, do their I thing. Hate that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, I don't so like that cor- movie. There's a correlation. I love having correlations from different yeah. people who don't know each other. You know. So yeah. Thank, thank you for that. That's fascinating. Sure. And uh, let's talk about this. Wasn't so much at the uh, pit conference, but I believe that the two, they're you're in my one of my favorite species, and they're they're the cat species. So do you want to talk about them? The cat oh, sure. Species. The Felisavis. Yeah. Yes. In August of 1978, uh, Mark and our space fleet was called out to in, to go to space. There was going to be some kind of alien conference out on the asteroid Vesta. I don't I don't know much about what the plans were for the conference because, you know, the the whole incident took a different turn. On his way to the conference, and Mark was commanding one of our big uh, battleship space cruiser things, and on his way, his ship encountered this wonderful new species. It was actually a first contact with this cat species. And just like in, I imagine on in the Star Trek you know, TV show or the movies, uh, this face comes on the screen of his, you know, in the command, I guess the bridge, whatever you want to call it his command area and it's this cat and they're like I don't know seven or nine feet tall they have lovely fur that they like to like go to the salon and dye into different colors and patterns and things and they have some kind of wing that just comes out from like if they raise their arm it's it's like you know there's a wing there and it becomes like a whole wing Um, and then they have some kind of like mustachey Thing, not necessarily a mustache, but a kind of like a mustache above their lip, but they they speak telepathically or they communicate telepathically. They sing in this beautiful humming, singing tone, and they're very, you know, very good at ESP, and they can do like a mind meld thing like the Spock does on Star Trek. And anyway, they're very friendly. Uh, Mark and several of his team were able to go into their their world. Their world is like a a giant Dyson sphere, I guess, for lack of another thing. But and so they interacted and and met them, and they had some experiences in the sphere. And then when Mark came back from that mission, he took brought at least four of them with him. One is named Scarlet, and mm-hmm. they became ambassadors here because you know somewhere in the southern hemisphere, there's we'll just say an island that has several embassies for several species and that's where they live. Um, And so I've never met them yet. I can't wait to meet them sometime, but obviously they were not 
at either of these two conferences that we've talked about so far, but I wouldn't be surprised if they've been at some later conferences. So. Right. <laughs> but they and, sound and delightful. They do sound delightful. And um, I'm trying to remember some other things that he might have added to that. I just love that they paint their fur different colors. Or I know. Because <laughs> yeah, he said one of them even had her, her fur dyed in like a paisley pattern. <laughs> and I think Scarlet, you know, they called her Scarlet because she had her fur was red, red and stuff. And I just, well, that sounds so cool. Okay. But, you know, like the raptors, we talked about the raptors, especially the females. You know, they have, love to have their their claws painted and have little designs painted on them and stuff. So, you know, hey. <laughs> So there you go. We think we think tattoos are a new thing. Yeah. <laughs> they're not right. Everybody decorates themselves. Exactly. I, I do know that he said they're carnivorous and they're very very friendly and playful. And um, yes. they also yeah. they also the secretary general wrote up a report verifying their first contact with them, like you said, on November first, nineteen seventy nine, and presented it to the UN. And um, they were known. Just like you said, to fly, um, I got that image of those bats that have those wings kind of thing, you know, that they spread uh-huh. out, you know, with the arms. Right. But they fly, they have, their senses of hearing, smell, and eyesight are really acute. And yes. they believe that they had a radar ability as well as infrared vision. And they had these long tails that had motion centers on either side. And they used their tips to triangulate prey when flying. And they also used it for uh, sexual mating rituals. So, um, and they did tone. And didn't, am I remembering this right? Weren't they able to tone or use sound in a way that harmonized everything? And it could have been. I, yeah, I have this thing that one of the, uh, shall we say, uh, more mischievous uh, lethal groups of ETs came across them. And they discovered through the sound that they were able to make and the no fear that they were dealing with a sentient species. Because, you know, a lot of species started off arrogant like we did here on Earth, thinking we were the most sentient, sentient you know. So I, I, for some reason I have that memory. And the other thing you were saying about the Dyson sphere, yeah, he, um, one, the thing about that is they said they're, how they described it is the most unusual thing about that planet or sphere they lived in is they said literally everything else in creation revolved around their sphere. That was well, they, the, the sphere stays there. It's a fierce, yeah, the sphere doesn't, it's not like it's the center of a universe or anything, but everything moves past it because it just stays in one spot. So it's not orbiting anything. It just stays wherever it is. And that's interesting because I've never really, well, I don't remember any reports about them interacting with other species. So, but yeah, they just sound fascinating to me. And, like I've said many times here on your show and on every other show, it's like I would just love to have a big tea party and some of my favorite <laughs> species. We all just hang out, you know. <laughs> now we know where the Mad Hatter and Alice, you know, the tea party <laughs> all came from, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, we uh, – and by the way, you know, countless details and many facts are found in – um the writings of Mark that uh, we will tell you where to get towards the end of the show. Um, I've read all of them so far and they're, they're yes, amazing. So, so now that we've kind of, uh, you know, given uh hoo-ha to the cat species, we got to be fair and talk a little bit more about our upright canine friends, uh, the Canisonians. So do you want to talk about Mona Bestia and Storm Paul a little bit? Are there any stories you know about them? Uh, let's have a little look here. Let's see. Um, well, and you, you're so good. It's like you to mind several things that I, I tend to forget. I do know that they, yeah, I, I, it's like I do know that, the Canonians, it's funny because they're the way it spells it makes it look like it's Canisians or Cani I, I don't know, but Mark always calls them Canonians. So um, you know, okay. the I guess the S in the middle is silent, but I don't know, that's just what he says. But um Mona or Mona Bestia is 
you know, it's like she's she was their ambassador when he met their species. And like we said last time, or at the Exeter thing, um, their species was – they're, they're a merchant species. They want nothing more to do than just buy and sell between different species. That's their whole – you know, they're not trying to kidnap people, and they're not trying to take over the planet. They would love for humans to be their customers, but that's not possible at this moment. They were allowed at the 1961 conference to establish a base somewhere in Australia – uh, which is their their base, and they have a huge fleet from which they export bling and ex, you know commodities to space because the the other species out there love chocolate and Rolex watches and jewelry and you know beautiful silks and things like that. So so that's that's really cool. Um, Mona, in true dog fashion, you know she's got lots of little pups. And I believe her her storm paw, who's not a pup any longer, he was a young young pup at the time of the 1971 conference. But I don't know if he's in charge of the whole fleet or if he's – he might be in charge of the whole fleet at this point or in charge of one of their fleets, but he's definitely in charge of a major portion. He's, a, he's an important part of their um, – you know their outfit or their you know their their business, but they they basically are just they're business people. <laughs> but they've they've been um, friends of humans on Earth for thousands of years, and they've got great medical knowledge. And there are allies. They're they're fanatics about their food. They like only fresh food. They don't like anything that's processed. And uh, so that's one of the reasons why they wanted a base in our solar system. But, you know, the other thing is our our planet is situated so one – in such a great location in our galaxy for, com- you know, other beings coming and going. So we're we're in a great spot. And so they wanted a base so they could expand their, their trade opportunities. So the the little pups, the dogs love to study the sky. Um, so in the Cano- the Canonian telescopes were traded to the Australian government, and they liked to help you know help all the the help all the humans at the the conference. There's one story I do remember. I think when Mark first met Little Stormpaw, Stormpaw was had come out of the wherever the restroom you know that he was using and like I think he had toilet paper <laughs> tracking behind him <laughs> so you know but you know mm-hmm. to me I think of these species as I don't want to be so arrogant as to call them people but you know to me they're just they just don't look like us so, but you know that they're all we're all equal you know it's like we're all just people type you know for lack of a better word we're beings. all just beings and Thank again beings. I just yeah. you know Yes, we're all yeah. beings, and it's like, oh, you know, to quote Mr. Rogers, I guess, it's like, won't you be my neighbor? I just want to be friends with the ones who want to be friends with us. And it's like the dogs definitely want to be friends with us. So, um, you know, why not? But, again, and what I love, too, about a lot of these species is education is really important to them. They love educating their young, and they love teaching them, um, you know, how to – communicate with the humans and how to get along with other species and how to be good ambassadors for their own species. So, you know, we could learn a lot from them. <laughs> yeah. And they're big on science too, I think. Yeah. I think that was yeah, they're, they're, specialty. He ended up studying our sun because he was concerned about it. And now look what's happening, solar flares and all kinds of things. So that's yeah. kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah. They're, yeah, so I, but, I'm sure Australia is glad to have them there, wherever they are. Yeah, I know that they're, I'll just put, they're somewhere close to the Aborigines. And when the, the first human they met there was an Aborigine, which I consider one of the really original humans on the planet. And, of course, the Aborigines have rock art all over the place of all these species, just like many places do. Right, and, right, you know, right. the Aborigines didn't even think anything of it. They just both said hi to each other. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so it's a, it's a good place to have their base on the outback because you don't have many uh, curious tourists cruising around there, you know? I know, so. I know. 
Well, they're wonderful, oh and they're real. They're really sophisticated. They're really sophisticated. I mean, oh, they, they have. Uh, they can, you know, just so many things. They have two languages. Evidently, they speak in a mathematical bark system, and all kinds of different things. So, um, we love well, them. And it's funny too. I've never heard of who Mona's husband is. You know, I don't know if she has one mate or two or three or, you know, I don't know. All I ever hear about is Mona and the kids. So. <laughs> Yeah, her you know, her full I, name is Mona Bestia, by the way, folks. Right, right. Yeah, and yeah. I don't know, I don't know if they're monogamous or you know if they have a different mate for every litter of pups or or whatever. But um, another thing I'll have to ask, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I know there's so there's so much when you're studying this. Um, they also, I I think I mentioned this in part one or we we both mentioned this but just so you get a sense of them uh and again there's for you to look at is i think they're over six feet tall when walking and you already described right. a 200 pound frame and they actually will wear brown silk hooded cloak and to uh to cover their face and they're able to get from cars into a building without most people noticing because we know why everyone's like got their eyes down looking at their <laughs> cell phone, <laughs> cell phone well, right. and, and so many it's so not, many so species are like that you know yeah. there's a, a lot of species who will cloak i mean not cloak themselves as in making themselves invisible but they'll wear a cape or a, a hooded you know outfit or whatever and you know and sometimes just for fun different species you know pre-covid when there were Comic Cons and Star Trek conventions and all these cool conventions where everybody was dressing up. Many species could go to these things and everybody just thought they had the best costumes and it was actually they were just being themselves. And, yeah, but a lot yeah. of them will wear some kind of hooded cloak so that you can't tell. And again, like even um, Contessa Leona, when she's walking towards you, especially if she's got like, a hooded thing on, you know, she looks rather human until you get up close and see the fur but um right yeah it's 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 fascinating <laughs> it is and it's, i know their nose this particular species their nose only protrudes six inches so from their eye socket so you know it's not like they've got a huge long wolf nose right right so, right so right. it'd be easy to do go to las I vegas know. folks <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, that's a lot of the species love to gamble. That's joke. <laughs> yes, love to gamble. <laughs> oh gosh. Okay. So, uh, what what other things like what didn't you mention to me that there was a terrestrial interference occurring in one of the galactic committee meetings? I did, and that? I got this information. Well, yeah, I got this information from Mark's dad, and he said okay. that the committee meeting was called terrestrial interference in the galactic community it lasted one and a half days i think most committee meetings were only one day but it was so well attended it lasted one and a half days and again the the non-humans you know by 1971 we were traveling to the moon i mean we've been traveling to space and to the moon you know since the 50s if not a little earlier but you know so they mm -hmm. were well aware of our presence but now that we were going to the moon regularly it's like I mentioned they wanted to know what was our intention? What were we planning to do next? Were we going to treat the moon well because it's full of resources and space itself is full of resources. So, you know, are we going to stop at the moon? Are we going to horn in on other species mining operations on other planets and asteroids and things like that? Um, and, and again, as you and I've said, there were many species who had bases on the moon. So it's like, you know, were we just going to go wreak havoc when we got there? And, and I, you know, most people have, well, I don't know most people, uh, there have been pictures shown um, of like one of our early moon landings where the far sand dune or whatever it is, you know, it's been cropped off because there was somebody's ship sitting there. Um, oh, exactly. So, you know. Yeah. But again, there's Along so much the of people here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you could just, I was like, that. Oh. Um, but there's so much upheaval here, and we have so much drama on our planet. They really don't want that out there. They have enough. Of our, they they didn't yeah. want us exporting our, our division because we're not a unified species here on this planet, and they just don't want us bringing that out there. So, 
Um, but, you know, something must be shifting because all of a sudden we're talking about having moon missions again. So, and, and again, it's there are many species yeah. who, want, who want disclosure and who want interaction with the humans. So, um, you know, I have Indeed. no idea if the government's going to come through with disclosure like I think it was supposed to be this week. Who knows? I don't know. Also, I was going to share a little bit. I know I mentioned a species called the Thalarians. Um, from Andromeda, and provide, right? They're from somewhere on, in the Andromeda area. They have a unique energy. They look like a big stalk of celery with eyes. And you had found a, an interesting image of what you thought might be one when it was yellow. And I, well, that looks that looks pretty cool. Um, they love water. They smell like lemons. They're seven to nine feet tall. They don't sit, they sit at all, but they don't, like, bend and sit like we would do. They they get drunk if they drink, like, soda, caffeine drinks. Um, I don't think they drink alcohol <laughs> so at all, the but they, they'll get drunk just on caffeine. So <laughs> yeah. it's, well, it's I think pretty. They and, use our caffeine as, as a drug, actually. Because remember, well, the raptors would get, would get wired and kind of drunk on Orange Crush. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> anyway, I, know. I love yeah. that. But then, you know, kind of like in the movie Abyss, it's like, um, to me, it looks like Mercury, but like they could form themselves and like, like it looks like a big appendage of water, but it reminds me of, you know, Mercury um, and just like come forward to you or they can, they can extend themselves as this, you know, contained thing of water and like kiss you or touch you or whatever, and, and they seem very friendly, um, so so that's pretty cool. Um, but I'd like to know more about them. I don't know a lot about them, but I'd never heard about them before, so that's really that was really cool. They, they are. Mark's dad was and, really interested in them. Oh yeah, and I included a picture from the abyss in the YouTube. I probably got fifty pictures in there for people. So <laughs> um, yeah, love that it's movie. Like, I it, love that it is movie. one of my favorites. So um, maybe we'll finish, uh, take a couple minutes and explain, um, didn't Titania have a fun time entertaining some of the young raptors with her magical abilities? Wasn't she there I, a story I, I with that you were going to talk for, about? Yeah, I, I forgot to ask her how much magic was involved. But again, she and at least one of her sisters, it might have been more, she had several sisters, they played hostess to several of the alien groups and especially the raptors. And, you know, you would have to find different places around England. And they were mostly staying in Southern England, like in the Cotswolds and whatever. You'd have to, you know, you'd have to rent somebody's manor house or somebody's castle and, um, you know, keep the public out, you know, no, no public viewing today. But, it, you know, it was funny because she said, um, She'd have to, the young male raptors are very, like, aggressive and busy. You know, they're like, they're little boys. You know, they're running around and using lots of energy. Um, and so she had to keep them from hurting each other. The, and she had, a, she had her, a baby at the time. Her and Mark's son was baby or a toddler. I don't know how old he was, but I think he was just a baby. And, like, one of the females, um, her name was Raquette, and she was four at the time. She was very interested in this human baby and, you know, now Rockette obviously is grown and she's an important figure in the raptors that work here on Earth. So it, it's pretty cool that Mark has known her all these years. Um, mm -hmm. But what's interesting is you have to be careful when, when the raptors are, like, renting your house because they do so much <laughs> damage and they don't mean to. But, you know, you'll be lucky if you have any furniture left over. And, you know, then they'll eat the wrong things, and they love ice cream and Orange Crush. Well, they'll get into the freezer and eat all your ice cream, and then they stay up all night and vomit all over the place. And they had pet triceratops, so they were training their triceratops, and they loved to play games. And, you know, they loved – apparently they loved learning, um, so so that was cool. You know, they're, they're highly educated, but Titania and her, her – you know, she reported that the young raptors love to learn about the humans. They love to learn about our love for machines. Um, they they enjoy our TV, but they see no reason to invent the TV or build it. So, like, they like to borrow technology from other species. You know, if somebody else has got something that's cool 
they'll just borrow it, steal it, whatever, and now it's theirs. Um, We've become no, known as the engineers of the uh, solar system at this point. We can oh, really? we can remake and yeah yeah so we came we've come way up in most species estimations because we oh, have all, all, almost raised our tech abilities to equal if not more and we can back engineer anything and we can produce it very fast so we have a a lot of treaties going you know for that so that's really helped us move kind of more equal into the back into the galactic family. You know, a lot of the treaties are deals with, you know, how much technology can we trade with you and for what? So, but, Mm -hmm. you know, we, the humans, at at least a lot of us have, you know, we have a great relationship with the Raptor Empire and they are our friends. And, you know, Titania loved being around them. And I know Mark has loved being around them. I mean, Titania was so comfortable with them you know, she she allowed them to be around her baby, and you know, mm-hmm. so yeah, you know, it's, it's just, a big deal. It's really cool. Yeah, that yeah, is a so. really cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing. I mean, boy, we could we could have stories and you know till midnight. <laughs> but thank you so much, I know. Joanne, for sharing. Of it's, a, it's a great. And uh, I, where can people go to buy on the disc to learn more about you know these conventions and different things and different battles and different species because I've heard we're at least in active trade with over 900 ET species to this day. So, and you also have a new book, don't you? I do. Um, So the, the nonprofit that has all these cool species, you know, reports about space and all that good stuff um, is earth defense headquarters. The, the two websites are edhq.org that has a video of one of my talks and information about the organization. The other one is edhca.org, and that has a list of the different reports. And if these the pit reports on on there, I need to add them, and I apologize, but they are available. Pretty much everything I have is available as a PDF so that I can send it electronically because, um, you know, we haven't been going to conferences, so it's not like I make a bunch of copies and have them sitting around and mailing them. And a lot of people from not, you know, outside the United States love the report, so I, it's easy to send them a, a PDF. Yeah. Um, and they're so, really So I appreciate all that. Yeah, they are. <laughs> <laughs> they're very They are reasonably priced, yes. So my new book is called A Midlife Magic, and it is about my – transformative journey from like being a middle class suburbanite to you know and being an active Mormon for over 30 years and marrying and then how I met my current husband and and how he introduced me to these wonderful fields of UFOs and space and magic and cryptozoology and fairies fairies. (laughs) yeah and yeah and and again i think i said magic and i was already into the paranormal but i got more into it after he and i met because of some of the places i was going to and some of the people i was meeting so it if you Mm -hmm. want a signed copy you know people can email me at dragonhillbooks at yahoo.com or it's on amazon and barnes and noble if you just want a print copy and don't want it signed but um, you know, it, it, yep. if you get it from me, it's fifteen dollars, including shipping. And if you get it from the other places, it's nine ninety nine. So it's very reasonably priced too. So okay, well, thank you, Joanne. I'll certainly have you back. No, well, and, thank you uh, for more fun. And uh, in two weeks, I will have a wonderful guest, Elena Danan, born in France and a graduate in archaeology at the Louvre University, and worked for twenty years as a field archaeologist in Egypt. And she is also Ooh. a direct emissary of the Galactic Federation of Worlds and came here as an awakener to help and guide humanity to reconnect with their true nature and power and to embrace our sovereign, it, I always pronounce that wrong, sovereignty in this time of great awakening on Earth. Elena is in direct contact with her protector, Commander Thorhan Eridion, a fifth dimensional Palladian who is one of thousands of benevolent members of the Galactic Federation of Worlds. And she will be discussing current updates on what is happening 
in what is often referred to as Earth Liberation, which is happening now, and guide you wow. through the next level in consciousness evolution so that we can once again enter the larger galactic family as equal beings free and knowing no fears or limits, which is our true self. So wh- when you have a chance, go back to Super Soul Solutions YouTube to see the pictures, places, and species that we've been talking about and share those with your families and friends because uh, we're eventually going to be meeting all of them. And it is time that we humans remember who we are and why we came here. So thanks so much, Joanne, and thanks, listeners, and for joining in You're today. You're welcome. And, in, aw, and until then, And you've done a great upwards. job. You know, you, you've done a great job of putting it all together with the, the audio and the pictures for on your YouTube. Uh, that's amazing. Oh, Lots of you. hours of work. So well done. Well, my sister Allison gets credit for that. <laughs> but thank I you. I know, but, you thank know, it's you. like you're a great team. And it's the the end result is wonderful. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay. So Thanks. until next time. Okay. Okay. Take care,